All right. I think we are all set. Welcome everybody to today's public seminar from the Center for Clean Water Technology. My name is Niels Wolkenborn. I'm a professor at SOMAS at Stony Brook University. And I'm also obviously a research collaborator within the Center for the Clean Water Technology. And my well, one of my focuses is really on um, looking at permeable reactive barriers as a way to treat legacy, legacy groundwater nitrogen um, to deal with our problems related to coastal ocean eutrophication. And this is really what I want to talk about today. I here already should acknowledge the contribution of many people. Uh, without them, this work would not be possible. Obviously, right now, Jing An Lin is a PhD student in my lab, and I will present lots of his research today. Stuart Waugh, who is research coordinator. Um, obviously, well, without him, also much would not be possible. Caitlin is um, managing the analytical lab, which is very important. And then Chris Gobler and Hilary Brooks, who keep the boat um, driving, let's say. And then on the other hand, this work is also to a big part a collaboration between the Center for Clean Water Technology and Cornell. Um, and specifically, I want to acknowledge Ron Paulson, who I hope is, yes, he's on the call as well, which is great, and Molly Graffin, um, Matt Sclafani. But really, like Ron has worked in this area for many years, and he is always willing to share information, and we work together on many different projects. Molly herself has done her PhD in my lab and now works uh, for Cornell. And so this has been a very fruitful um, collaboration. And you will see that lots of this research comes from this collaboration. So I want to start in giving a rough, a short introduction into the problem. And well, the first thing is not a problem. It's, it's a fact that all of Long Island is a watershed. And that's what Chris Vogler always emphasizes. Rain that comes down on our island infiltrates the soil and then adds to the water table. And since there's continuous evaporation precipitation, this water is slowly, the groundwater is slowly moving towards the base. And there, due to, well, partially through rivers, but also through submarine uh, groundwater discharge, this groundwater eventually ends up in our coastal ocean. Typical rates of uh, groundwater velocity, just like it can be very different, but let's say it's about a foot per day. So this is maybe a number that is good to, good to realize. Now in Suffolk County, we have lots of houses that are, are not connected to wastewater treatment plants. They have septic systems, as you all know, and we have quite, a, quite some of those, about 360,000. As you all know, with this not uh, partially treated or almost not treated wastewater, a lot of nitrogen goes into the ground. And that is basically um, the start of the problem. Each of these systems discharges approximately 40 pounds per, of nitrogen per year. This water then infiltrates well, it adds to the groundwater, which is then, as I said before, slowly discharging into the ocean. And this is a really nice picture that gives these, this discharge some numbers. So you can see here the total recharge, which is due to rain coming onto our island. And then you here see some numbers that give you an idea of how much of this water is discharged to the north, how much of this water is dis discharged to the south shore, and these are values in millions of gallons per day. So a lot of water constantly is discharged in the coastal ocean, into the coastal ocean. Since the water is moving relatively slowly, you can imagine that the residence time can be quite long. So this is a map that shows you Long Island. And in different colors, you see how long it approximately takes for the groundwater to move from, from a certain place to the ocean. And you can see that, well, obviously close to the coast, this is typically just like a matter of years before the water discharges into the ocean. But the yellow areas, the blue areas, there we talk about decades, if not centuries, before this water is discharging. And if you overlay this with uh, unsewered residential, residential parcels, you see that in all these areas, we have these unsewered residential parcels 
that constantly add nitrogen to the ground, to the groundwater. And one of the consequences is obviously that as we look uh, into the ground, we see increasing concentrations of nitrogen, uh, of, of nitrate or NOx in the ground. These are data from Suffolk County, which give you a sense of how, how high the average concentrations are given by these big numbers. But you can also see that these concentrations are very patchy. So in some areas, you can see 10 or even 20 milligrams per liter of nitrogen in the groundwater. And then as this nitrogen is discharged, you are all aware of the numerous problems that we are facing associated with these nitrogen uh, released to the ocean, to the coastal ocean, specifically algal blooms, hypoxia, which occur every year again and again. So one of the ideas, and this is the idea I want to talk about today, is the uh, introduction of denitrifying permeable reactive barriers, which in principle you could imagine as you have probably heard a lot of these nitrogen removing biofilters, which also uses wood chip. And here we do the same, but here it's a vertical barrier which intercepts the groundwater, uh, with the groundwater flow. And in this wood chip media, the conditions are just right to promote denitrification, which means nitrogen, nitrate removal and the formation of nitrogen gas, which is about 80% of our atmosphere. Now, I want to already now tell you that it's not a question of should we do one or the other. I think it's really important to realize that these permeable reactive barriers, they have an advantage in that they uh, are, can be close to the shore and thus the nitrate that is removed will directly have a positive impact on the water quality in our base. So in principle, these could buy us some time until we have upgraded all these septic systems. And on the other hand, there is already a lot of nitrogen in the ground, which will continue to seep into the ocean over the coming years, decades, and even centuries. So there's a good motivation to use this potentially as an additional tool, or to use it as an additional tool to remove nitrogen from the ground and prevent, from this, prevent this nitrogen from going into the coastal waters. In these wood ships, the processes that occur are manifold. Uh, the most important ones is that we have these lignocellulitic material where microbes degrade this material to smaller organic molecules. We call them typically dissolved organic carbon. And then microbes in the ground can use this organic carbon to produce carbon dioxide. Now, the important part is that they need different or they need electron acceptors to do this. And typically, if there's oxygen present, they will use oxygen to do exactly this process. Once oxygen is consumed, however, the next energetically very valuable electron acceptor is nitrate. And this is what we are after. So we want to have anoxic conditions. Oxygen is depleted so that nitrate is the electron acceptor and denitrification will produce mostly N2, although there may also potential for nitrous oxide formation, something we don't want because it's important to keep greenhouse gas. Now, once nitrate is depleted, there are other electron acceptors that, that are in principle available for microbes to continue this process, namely sulfate, which is typically not very at high concentrations in groundwater, However, in these near shore systems, we sometimes have significant um, concentrations of sulfate. So we need to also account for a process that, which is called sulfate reduction. And if all these other electron acceptors are used up, then there are methanogenic bacteria, which can even use CO2 as an electron acceptor, which produces methane. So I'm just telling you this because what I want to emphasize today is that we really want to treat groundwater relatively gentle so that we deplete nitrate, but we don't run into these other processes which, which relate to the formation of secondary byproduct products that we want to minimize. Because for example, methane, again, would be a greenhouse gas and we want to minimize its release and production. 
So the goal of the overall goal of our work is to do research to inform site specific designs, PRB designs, to maximize the nitrogen removal and minimize the formation and release of such secondary byproducts. For example, greenhouse gases, but also metals. I will not talk much about metals today, but this is certainly also one of our interests. And over these next 20 minutes, 30 minutes or so, I want to give you uh, some ideas of the research we are doing and some of the insights we have drawn so far from this research. I want to start with talking a little bit about a column experiment that we have done over the last two years in which we continue to study the hydrobiogeochemical processes in wood sheet media, which relate to BR PRB function. I then want to talk a little bit about one relatively new system, again, installed by um, our collaboration. And really, the, the, the uh, installation was really um, led by Ron Paulson and, and uh, Cornell. I also want to talk a little bit about what we do with all those data and one um, uh, aspect that we started to work on is reaction transport modeling, basically to use all this information to make more informed decision on PRB design. I also want to talk briefly about some of the cost benefits of PRB, just giving some context about what you get for your buck when you do something like this and just comparing it if it's feasible in the long run or if it's just to, like too expensive or whatever. And then I want to talk a little bit about the next steps that we plan to do over the next couple of years. So I want to start talking about an experiment again that has been uh, run for a relatively long time, one and a half years. You here see Jing An proudly in front of his columns. These columns were filled with different wood chip media. Actually, this, this, this was media that was already in ground for about five years before these systems were excavated and uh, Ron Paulson was able to provide us some of this material. And you see, we use different, three diff uh, four different types of wood chips, wood chip pea gravel mixtures. We had columns with oak and pine, an oak pine mixture and a maple cherry mixture. And the nice thing about such experiments is that you can do true replication. So you get this sense of how representative your data is, or you can do statistical tests if one or the other matrix performs better or, or not. The ma experimental manipulations obviously is something that's why we do experiment. We can control how fast we pump water through those columns. We can change the concentrations of nitrate in the influent. We can change the temperature and thus get information about how things may change over seasonal cycles. And throughout this experiment, obviously, we measure always what's going in, but more importantly, what's, going, what's coming out. And so we can assess rates of nitrogen removal. We can figure out under which experimental settings we see more or less of the secondary byproducts, for example, greenhouse gases. And another nice thing is that because we use transparent columns, we can look through them. And um, I want to start with showing you a little movie on uh, a dye injection that we did at the very end of this experiment, just to give you a sense how water is flowing through these columns. So this is a rhodamine dye. And you see, um, obviously, speed it up. Um, these are 30 hours in just 15 seconds. And you see over time, um, that this dye is then visible in this overlying water in this upward flow setup. We use an upward flow setup because many of the processes we induce in these columns are gas producing uh, reactions. So with the upward flow, we allow these gas bubbles to move up and leave these columns. But in principle, you can imagine this as a one meter thick PRB and we just take a core, a horizontal core from this PRB and put it uh, in a vertical position. So transparent cores not only allows us to use, to, to use inert, inert tracers, but we also sometimes use uh, planar oxygen optodes, optodes, which are these pink strips, this foil that we can glue on the inside of these columns and these allow us with a specific camera and under the illumination with blue light 
to measure oxygen within these columns without, I don't know, drilling a hole, for example, through the column. We can really image it behind the transparent wall of these columns. And data uh, that we get from this look like, like something like this here. Uh, sorry, the scale bar will probably come up in a moment. But in principle, you see the black color means there is no oxygen. And these white and reddish colors means 100% air saturated water. And these are now snapshots of these eight columns with, uh, for example, here we apply a, or simulate a groundwater velocity of about two foot per day. Uh, we see a specific depth of oxygen penetration into these wood chip columns. When we increase the pumping rate, uh, uh, pumping rate not surprise, oxygen will penetrate deeper into these columns. And this information is important for us because groundwater is typically rich in oxygen. And thus, knowing how deep oxygen is penetrating at a specific flow regimes allows us to assess how much of the wood chip uh, PRB, uh, how much of the wood chips will remain unoxic under specific conditions, because only then they can really contribute to denitrification. We can also, or we have also changed the influent oxygen concentration because groundwater is not necessarily 100% air saturated. So here we approximately half the oxygen by bubbling with N2 and CO2. And so the influent water had then some lower oxygen penetration. And obviously oxygen is then penetrating not that deep because there's less oxygen coming in. This movie shows you how the oxygen is in principle going into these columns when we increase the flow rate, for example, here to four feet per, per day. Another nice aspect of this work is you see here, we stop the flow and you see how the oxygen is decaying. It's consumed by these microbes in, in, in the wood chip matrix. So it's not only seeing how deep oxygen is penetrating, we can also get rates of oxygen consumption. And that in the uh, and we measure this in the absence of movement. So this is an important rate that we later on, uh, as you will see, can use in reactive transport models to basically predict how much of a PRB would remain unoxic under a specific flow regime. So this is the data that we get from these uh, time series of oxygen images. Uh, for each pixel we can image pixel we can calculate the rate of oxygen decline the oxygen consumption rate and you see here the approximate range of from about two micromole per liter and minute but oftentimes one or even less but it's sufficient to deplete oxygen while water is traveling through this wood chip media through this aged wood chip media with an active microbial community however one of the other aspects we obviously investigate in such experiments is how much nitrate is removed. This is a figure, uh, lots of bars here, but in principle, you will see several of those. And just to guide you through it, um, we have different experimental treatments. So these here are um, the effluent nitrate concentrations for a given hydraulic resonance time, which relate to some groundwater velocity. So about two foot per day, four foot per day, eight foot per day. We also did some dynamic oscillations of the pumping rate because this is some, something we sometimes see in these systems. Just to confirm that, for example, here where the average resonance time is as if we would co pump constantly, the results are actually quite similar when it comes to the effluent nitrate concentrations. In black is the influent nitrate concentration. So we used a relatively high concentration here, as high as maybe at some of the hotspots, but oftentimes groundwater nitrate concentrations are lower. However, it doesn't really matter how much we put in, we can estimate the rates per centimeter or per inch of wood chip layer. You can see that in different colors, the different media that we tested in this experiment show different um, performance. Um, typically, pine, the pine media always had higher effluent concentrations than the other PRB wood chip types that we used in our study. When the water moves relatively slowly, here in this case with an influent of 20 milligrams per liter, um, we see 
pretty much no nitrate in effluent from oak, oak and pine, maple and cherry, but still a significant amount in the pine um, columns. No surprise if you pump a little faster, then um, the water is exposed to, this con to these conditions and to an active microbial community for a shorter period of time. So then you start seeing F nitrate in the effluent, also in some other wood chip types. If you pump even faster, again, like you see the same pattern, hardly any removal under these conditions in the pine columns, but still like 50% or so in the other, in the other three. Now, when we think about what we are measuring here, effluent nitrate concentration is interesting, but it doesn't really, uh, well, the effluent nitrate concentrations are obviously dependent on how much we have in the influent. And so it's way more informative to think about those data in terms of removal rates. And that's what we typically do. So now here you see the mean nitrate removal rate in milligrams of nitrogen per day. And actually there should be N per column because that's what we measure here. And you see that for specific settings, the rates are actually not so different. There is a relatively narrow range, let's say between three or four, and maybe here under these settings, a little bit more than 10 um, milligrams of nitrogen removal per day and per, per column. Again, like important rates that allows us to predict how thick a PRV should be for a given site. We can also change the temperature and that's what we did. And no surprise at lower temperatures, for example, here about seven degrees, which is approximately the winter temperature of groundwater on Long Island. You see obviously a decline in nitrogen removal performance. And since these systems are out there, well, we should consider this and we can optimize nitrogen removal for, for a specific temperature, for example. We also look at when we add influent, um, we, we do not only measure nitrate in the effluent, we also look how much of this dissolved organic carbon is in the effluent. And it makes totally sense if you think about it that once nitrate is depleted and there are not many other electron acceptors available, then you actually see quite some dissolved organic carbon in the effluent. So this bar here corresponds to this bar here. So you see in the O columns where nitrate was totally depleted, we have actually quite high DUC release from those columns, which, um, which is not visible in these other experimental settings when you still have decent amounts of nitrate in the effluent. Similarly, we can measure the, or uh, we measure the concentrations of greenhouse gases. And specifically, I wanna focus here on methane. And it's in principle, the same picture um, when nitrate is depleted in the effluent, only then you see increased concentrations of methane showing that as long as there's nitrate within the system, you barely produce methane in the effluent, or you ba barely have methane in the effluent. Now, some of you may be concerned about methane. Well, that's something we don't have, but I want you to, I want to tell you that these concentrations here, 200, 150 micromolar, that's relatively small when you compare it to many other um, ecosystems out there, for example, in mudflats and unvegetated mudflats or in, in salt marsh sediments, you can easily, in many places, you can measure pore water methane concentrations in the millimolar range. So an order of magnitude higher compared to what we measure in these column studies when nitrate is depleted. Switching gears a little bit, um, with Molly Graffin, she did a lot of the work at the test cell that Ron Paulson installed at Hampton Base. You see, her, you see Molly working here, taking samples. This was basically a small test cell that allows us to um, get some preliminary data or some data on the functionality and on the performance of such a, a wood chip permeable wall. And in this, um, system, we had obviously uh, different ways of sampling pour, pour water upstream of the system, within the system, downstream of the system. There was a pipe where we could uh, include autonomous sensors to monitor 
oxygen and temperature and salinity over time. And I briefly want to only talk about some of the data we got from this. You can read more about this about the, in the paper we published last year. One thing important to know is when you com compare the nitrate concentration upstream, within, and downstream, you clearly see some dynamics over time as the water level is changing with the tides. But when you go from upstream to the PRB center to downstream, you see that over this tidal change in tidal height, pretty much we saw never, we measured never substantial or any nitrate in the effluent, meaning this test cell was really performing very well, removing all of the nitrate that came in. We also did column studies already back then with different influent concentration, different pumping rates, just like Jing An did in his uh, last experiment. And again, we can come up with a relatively narrow range of nitrogen removal uh, per column, in this case, about 3 to 4.6 milligrams per column and day, which relates, if you think about the cross section of a PRB, to about 0.9 to 1.3 kilograms per square meter of PRB per year. And just again, to put things in perspective here, with a PRB that is 10 feet deep, we could potentially remove a between six and 8.7 pounds of nitrogen per year per meter of shoreline, which is in the range of what a typical um, septic tank per person releases annually. It's again, not to tell we should not do something upstream, but the nitrogen that is in the ground, there the um, PRBs could obviously tremendously help. So with this information, um, we um, so based on the data that we collected in, in column studies and also from the site characterization, we estimated that for that site at Hampton Base, uh, probably a 2.5 foot thick trench type PRB would be a good thickness so that the system typically would remove all the nitrate or almost all the nitrate, but it would not overperform and potentially uh, act as a source of methane or so. And we were really excited and I'm really excited that this, this project was, uh, was realized last year um, through CPF funding to the town of Southampton and the Hampton Hills Association was a great supporter of this work. It's on their property. Ron lives close by, and here you see the construction phase, basically these cells here. The vinyl sheeting of the bulkhead was perforated below ground with these holes, so that the water that would, will, will be pushed against the wall has a way to escape the wood chip media. You see Molly here standing in, in, in front of what is clearly not a trench bay, trench type PRB, because that was such a great opportunity because we had already preliminary data to think about, okay, how can we learn even more from a system like this than just like installing one type of PRB? And what we did is we proposed to install four different types of test cells, each of those about eight foot wide and about five foot deep. We installed uh, a PRB that was our predicted optimal thickness. But that was for summer, uh, for, for winter temperatures and, uh, sorry, for summer temperatures. And we also wanted to be the system very effective in winter time where you may need some more material. So we decided, okay, let's, in some of these cells, let's just double the thickness. And now we can monitor over time um, to what extent the performance is different in a thicker PRB than in a thinner PRB. And then we also decided for another treatment, which would be maybe even a more cost-effective way of installing these PRBs, which is this column approach. Um, the idea is that water will be attracted by these columns and thus will preventually move through one column a, a row after the other um, before it, it, it leaves the PRB to the ocean. And you can see here with my calculations of the square foot of wood chip used in each of these types, you could even like save a lot of wood chip media 
And one of our expectations is that they may be actually treatment of nitrate in between these columns as the water is anoxic and DUC is still available for microbes within the sand surrounding the wood chips to also denitrify. And then if you think about experiments, it's always important to have a control group. In this case, it's the same kind of cell, but without any wood chip media. And now we did this in this installation where each of these PPRB types were um, replicated three times in a randomized block design. So this will really allow us, uh, this will allow us to do some really sophisticated uh, statistical testing on the results. And in most of these cells we measure, um, uh, we, we access water from within the PRB and uh, upstream of the PRB and downstream PRB. In one of these blocks, we can even do this at two different depths because overall the PRB, uh, the, the, uh, the PRB is about 12 feet deep. Again, just to put something here, put, put this into perspective, assuming that we have, a, or we know that approximately the mean groundwater velocity at the site is about two foot per day. It's variable due to the tides. But knowing now the area of the PRB, we have a rough idea about how much water is treated every day, about 6,700 gallon. And assuming that there's about five milligrams of nitrogen, nitrate in the water at the site, we can predict that there will be approximately a removal of nitrate of about 46 kilograms per year. Again, relating this to a discharge system, uh, to a septic system, which dis dis discharges a tenth of this, this or so. So we have started to sample the system and that's obviously very exciting. And I wanna show you some of the early data from this. So it looked maybe a little messy during construction, but you can see here that after it's finished, you don't see anything. Um, this is the new bulkhead and here in the subsurface, there are the cells. And Ron and Molly did a really nice job in having everything subsurface, but still like, imagine there are like dozens of sampling ports, but it's all, all very well organized. So you can see here, we can connect the tubing to a peristaltic pump and pump water from these different um, connections, which gives, brings up water from specific areas within the test cell. So oh, there's, there's a peristaltic pump and then we collect the samples here. So some data. Here are all the nitrate data from these different test cells and I don't wanna go into detail here, but overall, or if we get the means of all these three replicates, you first see like the groundwater wells had relatively low nitrate concentration during this camp sampling campaign, somewhere between four and five milligrams per liter. Directly upstream, upstream of the treatment cells, the concentration were actually typically a little higher. And I wanna talk about this in a moment. Then upstream within the PRB media, while in the control, not much is happening because there are no wood chips, but you already see a decent decline in the two point, or pretty much in all these test cells. And by the time the water reaches the downstream region of the PRB, barely any nitrate is in the water anymore. So they perform very well. <clears throat> now, the higher, I mentioned the higher um, concentrations upstream of the treatment cells compared to the groundwater wells that are further upstream may suggest that there's actually more polluted water from larger depth attracted. There are older studies by Robertson et al. that did some modeling. Um, here, for example, you see a PRB, which has a higher permeability than the surrounding soil. And in these simulation, you can, can clearly see that the water is attracted by this highly permeable material. And thus you can attract water from higher depth and potentially because the water may be higher, may have higher nitrate concentrations further down. Um, that's why we see the higher concentrations upstream. This is just like the first sampling campaign. So we clearly need to work more on this and confirm that this is the case and potentially also look at deeper um, 
uh, regions within the or uh, below the groundwater well that we have right now, which could us which should could get us more information if our hypothesis is right. We also have these pipes within within the PRB media. So this is a great way of looking continuously about the dynamics within these PRB systems. Again, very busy graphs, but in principle, the gray shaded area are the tides in Shinnecock Bay. The black line is the water level within the PRB test cell. The red line is the temperature. The green line is salinity. The blue line is oxygen. So we can measure, or we do measure all this simultaneously. And here I just show you two examples of the 2.5 feet PRB test cell in the control cell. So overall, what we see, and that's maybe not surprising, we still see some tidal fluctuations in the PRB, but this tidal signal is slightly delayed and a little dampened. So while we see about a four foot tidal range in the bay, the water level change in the test cells is only about two foot. Um, we see continuously anoxic conditions in the center of the PRB when there are wood chips, but we see the you know, typical uh, groundwater uh, oxygen concentrations at the site without this wood chip media. So somewhere between four and six milligrams per liter of oxygen. We also see sometimes this intrusion of seawater. We are not exactly sure yet how it's exactly entering the PRB, um, but it's clear because it's so close to the ocean. Actually, the, uh, the bay water hits uh, the PRB during high tides. It's not surprising that this is happening and it may raise some concerns. However, I can, well, easily, well, uh, previous work that we have done where Molly added water with nitrate with different amounts of salts in the water. So basically mimicking these different salinities in the water, we could not see that uh, increased salinity has a negative impact on denitrification. So here's the effluent concentration for the different treatments, multiple days after we added the seawater, and you can see that the effluent nitrate concentrations were almost the same over the course of this experiment. We did see some increased sulfite in the effluent when we had more, uh, when we had a higher salinity, because with this higher salinity, we supply the system with sulfate, which is abundant in seawater. So in some areas of the PRB where nitrate is limited, or be becomes depleted, sulfate reduction kicks in. But it's a little bit the same as with the methane I mentioned before. If you compare these concentrations like in the low micromolar range, this is much, much lower than what we often see in tidal wetlands and mudflats where it can easily be in the millimolar range. So we have all these reactions. We start to, uh, we improve, we currently, we continuously improve our understanding of the processes, how they are temperature dependent, under which conditions uh, nitrate removal is maximal, how these secondary byproducts are formed. Um, uh, and, but so we can obviously only measure this for the systems we have in place from some laboratory experiment we do. And one of the cool things about reactive transport modeling is that you can go beyond of what you do in your experiments or what is happening at your specific site. And this is work that we do in collaboration with Christoph Meile. Um, he is a reactive transport modeler for decades and he um, helps us to set this model up and run it. And here you see, for example, the flow field for a column array type PRB. Uh, we can obviously apply whatever flow rate we want by changing the boundary conditions. Here you see that with a um, ambient groundwater velocity of about 1.2 foot per day, the velocities in this highly permeable material may actually be or will be significantly higher about twice because the water ten tends to move through these higher permeable areas while there are more stagnant conditions between these columns. Um, to do this work, we obviously need a lot of information that we have from our uh, field work, but also from our column studies. Uh, we typically measure the hydraulic conductivity of the materials we are using. Uh, 
And from the experiments, we know the rates of nitrogen removal. We know the rates of oxygen consumption. And so once we have a flow field that represents a specific condition, we can add reaction rates. For example, the oxygen consumption rates that I showed you before, and thus the oxygen penetration into wood chip media, and thus how much of the PRB material remains anoxic under specific conditions. We can then add the nitrogen removal rates that we, measure, that we measured in our column studies. And potentially that's the next step also assess under which conditions we see greenhouse gas formation. So here are the concentration, again, the, the same model, top-down view. And here now we applied different incoming nitrate concentrations. The rest is all the same. So for about seven milligrams per liter of nitrate coming in, the first row of the columns already remove, remove a little bit of the nitrate. The second row adds to this in the third row, Why in a lower um, incoming nitrate concentration, this design would clearly overperform. So these models then can be used to really make informed decisions about um, the optimal design at a specific site. So I want to summarize um, already now a little bit because, um, and, I, and, and I really want to emphasize again, the nitrogen crisis that we have on Long Island and elsewhere, as is shown or as is indicated also in the concept of planetary boundaries, where we have really screwed up the nitrogen cycle on our planet. Um, it's not like we can, well, just like getting our septic systems better, that's obviously a biggie. But until this is really effective, there are other tools that we should, we should use because we really need a multi-pronged approach. And we think that these strategically placed PRB are an additional tool in the toolbox to remove this legacy nitrogen and we will have immediate reductions of nitrogen input into our coastal waters. And when we think about sites, it's not only how much nitrate is in the ground or is it in the groundwater as a specific site. It's also very important to understand how fast the water is moving because just like half of the nitrate concentration in the groundwater at a twice as high speed would allow us to treat us or to remove exactly the same, same amount of nitrate. So it's not only about the nitrate concentration, it's also about the drive of groundwater that we have at a given site. The removal rates, we now have already a lot of data on how different wood chip types or at least different media and temperature and groundwater velocities and dissolved oxygen concentrations all relate to nitrogen removal rates. These data, as I said, can help us to, minim to make informed decision and minimize formation and release of secondary byproducts and hopefully also reduce installation costs. So the column approach could be one, it's much easier to order in columns of wood chip than in, at least in some places than to install a, a true trench of wood, wood chip material. And the bulkhead PRBs have the advantage that we can do this in parallel with necessary upgrades of our coastal infrastructure. And very briefly talking about costs here. So our current, estimate of a PRB is about $50,000 per uh, for a 100 meter PRB. Well, these values are obviously um, hard to make because so far we mostly have, well, more complicated PRBs because we still want to learn things. So with all these sampling ports and cells, this is obviously more, more, more um, uh, expensive than it should be, but we still need to learn. But we have a rough idea about how much Nitrogen could be removed by such a by such a 100 foot wide PRB, and if we assume that the life uh, time of a PRB is 20 years and it may be longer, then we pay about 50 dollars per kilogram. Putting this into perspective, um, in the Florida on-site sewage nitrogen reduction strategy study. Uh, they estimated that it costs, for example, upgrading septic systems. You see that the values are very comparable. And then lastly, I want to emphasize is, yes, these are investments, but by not doing anything, we will co face costs. It's just like with climate change that we will, that our that future generations, for example, need to pay for, or we are already paying for it. 
And there are, again, like lots of papers. I looked at some papers from Compton. Uh, he estimated that, I, I think it's a he, sorry, I don't really know it, but um, estimated that just like the cost of coastal ecosystem dam damage largely due to eutrophication is about $18 per kilogram of nitrogen released to the coastal waters. And in an earlier study, it was estimated that just like the loss of aquatic vegetation, namely seagrasses, has a huge negative impact on fisheries, which was alone like calculated to be about $56 per kilogram of nitrate. So it's very, uh, it makes sense economically to install those systems compared with other are, well, it's just in the same ballpark as other strategies, and we will avoid these costs that we, well, uh, that we that we should avoid. So there, are obviously, there's still work to do. One of the main focus in the next couple of years will be to think about, okay, so far we measured, for example, how much methane or how much iron is in the effluent in a column study, for example, but we don't know yet exactly how these secondary di byproducts behave and if, for example, methane is really released to the atmosphere, because if there is a buffer in which this methane is, uh, is uh, oxidized by um, micro micro microbes, and it will not uh, enter the atmosphere, it may not be very problematic. So we need to do more like fate of secondary byproduct studies. We are also in the process process of ident identifying more sites um, and specifically we are interested in finding sites where bulkheads are replaced anyway and then install the PRBs um, with a bulkhead with a plant bulkhead replacement. There are other systems that we are working on uh, at various stages of funding and Ron is involved in many of those and if you have questions we can probably talk about some of those we are looking for sites with different hydraulic, hydrological settings. So where the flow, fl groundwater drive is different, for example, not so much tidally influenced, but we have, for example, now a carbon array at Georgica Pond, where the flow is really regulated by opening and closing of the inlet and thus changes in pond water, le water level. We are testing alternative carbon sources, for example, carbon ejections. We see more, many places where the main form of nitri nitrogen in the groundwater is actually not nitrate, but ammonia. So there, a wood chip barrier would not give us any good, but we are working on systems that um, will first nitrify this ammonia to become nitrate, and then have a multi-layer PRB that ultimately then removes the nitrogen. And there are also projects where we look at some of the co-benefits of PRBs. They have been used to remove all kinds of organic pollutants. So in principle, they could also give us some uh, extra benefits in terms of uh, contaminant removal. And in collaboration with DEC, we are working on a guidance documents using all this information from the different studies in the lab and in the field to help people um, to for example, uh, to, to inform people about what should be done in terms of site characterization, um, and then also make informed decision what would be a good carbon design for a specific site. So with this, I'm actually at the end. I thank you for being here. Uh, I would be happy to take questions or hear about your ideas. I again want to thank a lot to the funding agencies, specifically DEC for um, supporting the Center for Clean Water Technology, the Hampton Hills Association, who allowed us to install this research PRB at Hampton Base, funded through the Community Preservation Fund, and the collaboration with the Town of Southampton and Town of Brookhaven, where we are currently working on several projects, and they are really always a big help and obviously, well, making this work possible. And then all kinds of people within the Center for Clean Water Technology, both in terms of experiments and setups, administration. Um, there are people that I even mentioned in this talk, Jackie Collier and Shinwei Mao. They are uh, microbiologists. So oftentimes we take also samples from our experiments and they look then at the microbes and we'll probably hear in future seminars on that work. 
Ron Paulson, Molly Graffin, Matt Scafani, Patrick Murray is often helping with, with the work out in the field. At SOMAS, we have Henry Bokonjevich, who is obviously decade long experience in groundwater modeling and in general the setting here on Long Island. And he's always there to, well, share his knowledge with us. And Crystal Milo, who is really like interested in continuing this collaboration on reactive transport modeling. Well, thank you, Nils. That was really just a spectacular presentation. And I'm really glad that uh, you're tackling uh, PRPs for the center on behalf of the center. And uh, great job at actually giving acknowledgement to all our great partners as well. Um, I'm going to kick things off with a question just going back to your experiments with the different types of aged wood chips. And it's a twofold experiment. And the first one is, uh, with regards to the results with the pine, I'm wondering the extent to which you think it's hydraulic versus a chemical issue, or is it both? Um, so maybe I'll start with that instead of giving two questions at a time. That, that's a good question because we're just trying to figure it out. If you, and it went too fast, but when you saw in the beginning, the video where we injected the rhodamine dye, was clear that in the uh, pine columns, we saw effluent breaking through earlier than all the other columns, which indicates that the residence time in these columns were shorter than in the others. And we clearly need to normalize our nitrate, nitrate data to this difference in porosity and also flow field. So it's not just porosity, it's also in some of these columns, depending on how they were packed, you have sometimes these highways of of, of poor water flow, while in others it's more like sheet flow. So clearly there is a hydraulic component, I guess, to the lower nitrate removal in the pine columns. But obviously there are other studies that suggest that uh, hardwoods are, uh, sorry, softwoods are also not performing as well as the hardwoods. And to some extent it's true with the pine, with the oak pine mixture, which perform not as good as the oak, which suggests to me that also there's a difference in potentially DOC formation and release to the water, maybe a difference in the microbial community. I should say, however, that um, these were uh, wood chips that also had different chop sizes and some of these mix mixtures, there were more, more, more twigs, no tweaks, well, different parts of the, of the plant. And so, I, I, I wouldn't say that these experiments are truly just related to this is pine and this is oak. It's also a matter of how exactly they are chopped and certainly we, could, we should do more research to figure out what, for example, is an optimal wood chip size, size uh, for a specific site. So I think it's, it's, it's multi multiple and I, I hope that in the next couple of weeks we can see how much is related to hydraulics and how much is related to biogeochemistry. Yeah, well, that's uh, obviously important. It sounds like maybe worth looking at multiple sources of uh, wood chips. L last question, then I'll uh, pass it on, of course. Um, and that is, what about, to what extent do you think you, with that, you, you know, you're doing modeling of flow fields and such. I wonder the extent to which we could model uh, the, the loss of denitrification capacity of the different types of wood chips. And if that's data you think you can glean from some of your experiments uh, as well, or I guess, or, or yeah. Uh, what, uh, I could not, the loss of denitrification over time or? Correct. So, so essentially, can, can we model that to the extent where we could say that we expect this PRB to be functional for you know, X years? Uh, okay. So just like on carbon mass balance approach, let's say. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that, that could be possible. Mm -hmm. Thanks again. Hi, Nils. This is Arjun. Um, great Hi. presentation. Um, just a follow-up question on, on the DOCs that's uh, leaching out from these different types of uh, wood chips. Um, is it, are you convinced that's is, is it a biological process or can it 
also be that the wood chip is just leaching DOC in just in the presence of water. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think it's largely microbially mediated. And I mean, so I want to emphasize again, so these were wood chips that were in denitrifying units for five years. So mm -hmm. even though a short exposure to oxygen during the establishment of these columns, and sometimes after such, an, such a disturbance, you see an initial flux of DUC coming out of these wood chips, but this experiment then lasted for another one and a half years, and they performed pretty cons consistently. And I don't think that this is just like washing out of DUC. I think it's really related to the activity of lignol cellulitic bacteria. All right, great. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. Great presentation, Niels. Um, thank you. Uh, so ha having uh, studied these systems for a while now, can you make any general rule of thumb about how long you think site characterization should go on before uh, a decision is made about in, the installation of the PRV. What are the what are the critical uh, things you'd like to see in place before? I mean, I, I think I, I think you should really have a good handle on obviously the nitrate concentrations at a given site, and since this may be seasonally be different, I would say capturing the warm season and the cold season would be good. And it could be winter and summer or summer and the following winter, in a, if possible, maybe for an entire year. And then you need a good grip on um, the hydrologic, hydrological situation at, at a site. So how fast is the water move, moving and how variable is this movement? Again, like due to potentially tides, but also seasonal, uh, seasonal variations in groundwater discharge and some work I did not mention here because it's largely work that Ron is doing, is also doing some work on the marine side if the PRV is close to the shore. Um, so there he often uses his Trident technology, which is basically doing transects offshore. And just like looking at the conductivity gives you a sense of how large the area is of submarine groundwater discharge that you can see due to lower salinity in the pore water than in the overlying water. You get a sense of how far out this discharge zone is active, how active is it? And so this is also data that is very useful. In the end, I think, and I think, well, so in the end, I think it could be done within half a year. Uh, the more data you have, maybe it can help to make even more precise decisions. But I, I think so far, for example, here we predicted that two and a half foot would be a good size. And that's exactly right now what we see. After two and a half foot, we removed all the nitrate. The thicker one is a little overperforming. That may be different in the cold season where maybe there's significant effluent of nit uh, nitrate in the effluent from the thin test cells, but then the thick one is optimal. So, but I think half a year. Thank you. Excellent opportunity for students to ask questions. Yeah, also to our collaborators. Ron is here. I see Christoph Meile is here. Jing An, who does all the work, is here. Molly is here. So you heard what I know, but they know much more. So Ron, uh, Paulson, I uh, 
I heard Niels mention the Trident. I think uh, if you don't mind, uh, probably a lot of um, students here uh, and uh, faculty would be interested in learning more about that. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's an instrument that we developed oh, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, been doing this work a long time and worked with Henry Brokenyevich over the years, uh, developing, you know, and collaborating with him and uh, trying to understand submarine groundwater discharge. And one of the tools that we learned pretty quickly was that you need to map out the area offshore that's active effectively. And to do that, we develop a probe that can be inserted into the bottom. Uh, usually a foot or two feet down, and it will measure the conductance, can be a bulk conductance of the pore fluid and the material, or it could just take a sample and look at the conductance of the pore fluid. And it also does temperature, which gives you another signal, because groundwater is relatively stable through the year, but the surface water can get very warm or cold. So you can use temperature and conductance as a great tool to map out these discharge zones. And then you also learn about the types of bottom that are out there, which are very important. You know, we get sandy, gravelly bottoms. Usually you have a good chance it'll be much more highly effective over the silty, mucky bottoms. You know, I know that you've done work on, Stuart. So different dynamics. So that tool is very helpful. And the, the other tool that goes with that is a seepage meter uh, that we deploy that actually gives us the rate of groundwater discharge, which is extremely useful because it tells us if that has the advective properties, the groundwater flow velocities that would support a PRB. Because if you're seeing that discharge through the bottom, at these rates that not having done hundreds, maybe thousands of sites, you know, we know what ranges relate to the groundwater flow system. So we use those tools to do the initial screening because where do you start? <laughs> you, know, you can't drill wells everywhere. So we, we go at it that way. We found that to be very effective. And then we target the areas with wells and the traditional approaches to learn more about the specifics in the groundwater system, the, the you know, not only the, the hydrogeology, but sediment types, and then all of that, you can get a design together. So it's a multi-phased approach with those tools and expertise. Thank you, Ron. So Niels, we've gone over an hour. Um, if there are no other questions. And send, send me them per email. Yeah. <laughs>